Hello everyone and welcome to this video on the Stanford Prison Experiment. Okay, so the specification is very, very simple for this part of the course. You need to be able to outline and evaluate Zimbardo's research investigating conformity to social roles and specifically you need to know about the Stanford Prison Experiment. So let's make a start. So conformity to social roles is when an individual adopts a particular behavior and belief while they're in a particular social situation. So for example, whilst you're at school, your teacher will adopt the behavior and the beliefs of a teacher, which may be very different to the behavior and beliefs that they adopt when they're with their friends at the weekend, let's say. So this type of conformity is called identification. So if you think back to your lesson on compliance and internalization and normative social influence and so on, you'll remember that identification is when a person changes their public behavior and their private beliefs, but only while they're in a particular social role or only while they're in a particular situation or with a particular group of people. Okay, so let's have a little look. A bit of background to the Stanford Prison Study first. In 1960s America, there were lots and lots of reports of prison guard brutality towards prisoners. And to examine why that is, Zimbardo wanted to conduct a study that would kind of answer the question or help to answer the question whether or not guards are naturally brutal people, you know, whether that type of job just attracts people who enjoy, um, you know, being a little bit violent or hurting people and so on, or whether it's actually the situation that they're put into, the stressful situation, the fairly dangerous situation of working in a prison that creates behavior that could be considered brutal or violent. So he wanted to examine whether this behavior displayed in prisons was due to internal dispositional factors, so your personality, or whether the external situational factors, so the environment and the conditions of the prison, were more to blame than the guard's personality. And to do that, he conducted the Stanford Prison Study. So let's have a little look at what he did. So Zimbardo's sample consisted of 21 male university students who volunteered by responding to a newspaper advert. There were 75 volunteers and the 21 that eventually took part in the study were chosen based on their physical and mental stability and they were paid $15 a day to take part. So each participant was assigned randomly to a role, either prisoner or prison guard. The guards were given uniforms, they were given dark reflective sunglasses, handcuffs, a truncheon, and they were instructed to run the prison without using physical violence. The prisoners, on the other hand, they were stripped, they were given a, a numbered smock to wear, which is what you can see in the picture there, and chains were placed around their ankles. Now Zimbardo wanted to make it quite realistic, so he also arranged for the prisoners to be arrested at their homes by real-life local police, and then fingerprinted as well. He also turned the basement of Stanford University into a mock prison for added realism, and interestingly he instated himself as the warden of that prison. So he was in control of the guards, he was the boss of the prison, let's say. So he was actually in the study himself. And the whole thing was due to run for two weeks. Okay, so there's a lot of information there, so I'll give you a little bit of time just to write that down. There's a bit of a note-taking opportunity there, so feel free to pause the video. And I will move on to talk about the results. Both prisoners and the guards quickly identified with their social roles, so the study started well. However, within days, the prisoners rebelled against the guards. But that didn't last very long, um, because the guards very quickly crushed the rebellion, after which the guards then increasingly became very abusive towards the prisoners. 
So the prisoners were regularly dehumanized. The guards would wake them regularly during the night so they would stop them from sleeping. They'd force them to clean the toilets with their bare hands, and so on and so on. And what they found was that the prisoners became increasingly submissive to the guards and they identified more and more and more with a very subordinate role. It's almost like they just gave up and just accepted their fate. Now, five of the six prisoners were released from the experiment early because they had such extreme adverse reactions to the physical and the mental torment that they were being subjected to. So, for example, there was a lot of uncontrollable crying and they started to display extreme symptoms of anxiety and depression etc. So they had to be released early. Now bearing in mind the entire experiment was supposed to run for two weeks, it actually had to be terminated after just six days. And it wasn't even Zimbardo who ended it. It ended up being a fellow postgraduate student who had to convince Zimbardo that the conditions in his experiment were cruel and inhumane. And she actually had to convince him to end the experiment early because he couldn't see it. He was so in the experiment as his role as the warden that he couldn't see what he was doing to his experiments. And then it actually took somebody else from the outside to come in and say, no, this has to end now because this is terrible what you're doing to your students. Okay, so here are the results for you written down. So you can just take a few notes if you wish. Now, Zimbardo came to a couple of conclusions from his study. He concluded that people very quickly conform to social roles, even when the role goes against their moral principles. He also concluded that situational factors were largely responsible for the behaviour found, and the reason he came to that conclusion is because none of the participants had ever demonstrated any of these behaviours before, so it must have come from the situation that they were in. Okay, so that is the Stanford Prison Experiment. Now let's have a look at a couple of evaluation points. I've got two evaluation points written out fully for you, and then I've got a third one for you to think about as well. So the first one is, Zimbardo didn't take individual differences into account. Okay, so from in 1973, actually accused Zimbardo of exaggerating the power of a situational force to influence behavior, and he actually accused him of ignoring personality. And the reason he did this is because in the Stanford Prison Study, the behaviour of the guards varied very dramatically. So you had guards that were extremely sadistic and, you know, were quite violent and quite cruel towards the prisoners. But you also had guards who actually helped the prisoners and were supportive and sympathetic and gave them cigarettes and that kind of thing. You also had guards who just did exactly what they were asked to do. They followed the rules, they ran the prison with no violence, and were just exactly as Zimbardo was asked, had asked them to be. So it suggests that situational factors aren't the only cause of conforming to a social role. Personality also plays a role, and that's something that Zimbardo didn't take into account, which means that his conclusions could have been very overstated. It might not be all about the role that you're in. Your personality could also play a role in your behavior. Now, you've also got a lack of research support. So in 2006, Haslam and Reicher actually replicated Zimbardo's prison study. And what they found was that the participants didn't conform to their social roles automatically. So the guards didn't identify with their role at all or with their status, and they actually refused to impose their authority on the prisoners. The prisoners, on the other hand, identified as a group, and they challenged the guards' authority, which resulted in a shift of power and a com complete collapse of the prison system in that study. So results like that, contradict Zimbardo's findings because they suggest that conformity isn't just about the role that you're given. It doesn't happen automatically when you're given a role. What actually seemed to happen is that the people in that group have to create some kind of shared social identity. So in Haslam and Reicher's study, the 
participants, particularly the prisoners, identified as a group who were not going to be pushed around. They were not going to be dominated by the guards, and they gelled, and they became this cohesive group with a shared identity, and they actually took control. It wasn't just the fact that they were given the title of prisoners, they actually formed a social identity of their own, um, which is something that Zimbardo didn't take into account or didn't think about, um, and Haslam and Reicher did. Now that's called social identity theory, and it is suggesting that it's not just about the role that you're in, but also about the identity of that group as well. Now the final point that I have for you, this isn't one that I've written out, I'm just going to tell you about it and then you can think about whether or not you want to use it. There are also very good real life applications of Zimbardo's study. So the results from the Stanford Prison Study have been used to explain some real world atrocities that have been committed in prisons. For example, in 2003 and 2004, US soldiers tortured and abused Iraqi prisoners in a prison called Abu Ghraib. Now, Zimbardo believed that the guards who committed the abuses were victims of situational factors that made abuse more likely. So he said that the same factors that were present at the Stanford Prison Experiment, for example, a lack of training, boredom, no accountability to a higher authority, they were all present at Abu Ghraib as well. Now, if you add to that the opportunity to misuse power that's been given to you, because you're a guard, so you do have control in a prison, if you decide to misuse that power, that is then what led to the abuse, both in the Stanford Prison Study and also in Abu Ghraib as well. Okay, so we can use the things that we learnt from the Stanford Prison Study to actually explain what happened at Abu Ghraib and also, you know, other prison atrocities as well. And we can use the knowledge that we've gained from studies like Zimbardo's to actually make sure that stuff like that doesn't happen in the future. So that's just a real life application there for you to use if you wish. Um, it's a nice point to have. Don't forget, there are loads of evaluation points for Zimbardo's prison study. Ethical issues is another one. I haven't spoken about that on here, but it's always a great one to use for Zimbardo's prison study. So if you want to use that, then you can. And as I always say, if you don't like any of my evaluation points, that's absolutely not a problem. You will have access to loads and loads and loads of them in whatever book you are using. So that is the end of this video. I hope everything has made sense. I hope it's been useful and thank you very much for listening.